couple of weeks ago, I was in uh, Berlin and uh, I was in a certain mood, a certain frame of mind, and I decided to uh, ring up a friend and say, let's go out and have a coffee. And uh, so we met up and uh, met at this uh, cafe and um, walked in. I was like, what are we doing? Where are we coming from? Why are we here? We're these people on the internet. We're, we're making stuff. We're helping people do stuff on the internet. But what, what's it all for? And my dear friend was like, well, maybe we should sit down and order a coffee first. <laughs> and um, we started talking about it. I mean, I've been sort of making stuff and doing stuff for, for 10 or 12 years now. And I've made volunteering platforms in Australia. And I've done street art projects in London. And I've help teachers connect classrooms around the world, and I've started a company and all that type of stuff, but I was really thinking deeply about kind of where I was, and um, luckily my friend is kind of quite accustomed to my existential crises, and um, he thought about it for a second, and then he just said to me, Justin, pale blue dot, and I was like, right, um, I don't... Ah, and then I remembered. And of course, a lot of you will remember here that the pale blue dot, which is actually the picture, one of the most epic pictures of, of human history, actually, which is a picture of the Earth. And the Earth is just here. And it is less than a pixel on the original photograph. And the story of this pale blue dot is a, is a great one. It, was, uh, it all started in 1977 with the Voyager missions. Uh, and they wanted to send spacecraft up to take some photographs of Jupiter and Saturn and the moons. And they had this kind of golden opportunity once in 175 years to actually sort of get a good orbit and take these photographs. And so these makers, these doers, these technologists, these designers focused intensely and got this mission up there. And, and within a couple of years, they'd, they'd achieved their mission. They had these photographs and it was brilliant. And, of course, Voyager just sort of kept on going, and um, it was 1981 that Carl Sagan said, well, I, I've got this idea. I said, we should point the camera back. And people were like, well, it, it just doesn't work like that. You know, sure, there's Voyager and there's a camera, but it's kind of like going pretty quickly in the other direction. And he was like, wow, come on, guys. And this went on for years and years and years, and nothing happened. And towards the end of the, the 80s, the NASA scientists were getting retrenched and made redundant. And, and this whole idea was about to cave in. And, and thankfully, in 1990, uh, circumstances prevailed to enable them to turn Voyage around, point it back at the Earth, and take this photograph. Right? And we, we, we can all sort of see why it's such an epic photograph. This is taken from six billion kilometers away from Earth. And it shows us this, uh, as Sagan said, this mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. And it shows us our place in the cosmos. And actually, Sagan knew that this would do it. He, he didn't even want any scientific outcome from it. He knew it was this kind of idea. And uh, my friend sort of turned to me and was like, well, you know, the, the, the internet and the, the technology, it's been around sort of a a similar time to space technology as well. So what if we pointed the camera back onto the internet? And I was like, oh, man, OK, I really need to think about this. And I've kind of been thinking about it constantly ever since. You know, this magical, mystical, technological revolution, innovation that, that, that mankind has kind of invented the internet. What if we sort of like turned it back? Um, <laughs> if you are hoping for some type of iconic epic picture for the ages, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, th this is the most shared and most tweeted photograph, I think, in, uh, in human history, unfortunately. Uh, and it is, of course, that Oscar's selfie. And um, the idea that we can use this magical uh, uh, innovation to sort of generate this gigantic, narcissistic uh, selfie machine is kind of a little bit weird and maybe interesting in its own sense, but um, I'll come back to that. Because uh, the other thing that really leapt to my mind uh, and has been in my mind a lot for the, the last year when I sort of think about this idea of, uh, of, of looking back is uh, this, uh, this guy. Uh, very recognisable face. It was almost exactly a year ago that the 
the Snowden revelation started uh, uh, occurring. And completely regardless of the politics of this, I think that there's probably been no person who has held up a more searing mirror to our technology and our society than Snowden in showing that what we have actually created. I mean, the idea that, I mean, even if intentionally we set out with huge purpose and unlimited resources uh, to create a mass surveillance kind of global network, we probably couldn't have done better than what we've already, already achieved. So kudos to us for that. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the, the thing is, is that when I think back to these, um, these guys, the, the counter-culture radicals from the 60s, when they were sort of starting to think about this idea of connectedness and ARPANET was sort of starting to emerge, uh, they had this philosophy and maybe this utopianism around creating tools for personal liberation. You know, humankind has been sort of dominated by these hierarchies, institutions and obligations and, you know, what if we could break free of that? And this was kind of the philosophical underpinnings of the internet. Um, you know, in 1968, when the, the whole Earth catalogue was, was first published by Stuart Brand, you know, just, just under the subtitle, it said, access to tools. This was kind of like a philosophical precursor to the internet. And, and what... Snowden has done is kind of held up this mirror and it's kind of not so much about the idea of personal liberation and it's not just access to tools that the internet has provided, it's also access to us. And that's a really, really weird feeling. The other thing that I've thought about uh, a lot um, uh, in recent weeks is... Um, is a little bit similar to uh, what Lydia talked about. Um, I call it uh, the days of our Instagram lives. Right? Um, these are sunset drinks and double rainbows. Right? And I can afford to be ultra cynical about this because these are two of my pictures that I've shared uh, in recent weeks. And so this is all very good and well. I mean, we use the tools and applications that sit on top of this uh, marvelous internet infrastructure. Um, and we can express ourselves and we can share stuff about our lives and this is tremendously powerful. And, and, and yet, in this kind of social age, we share this version of ourselves, our social personas, right? And for better or worse, our social persona is often based on sunset drinks and double rainbows. And that might be all good and well. But humans have this terrible tendency to compare. And what we tend to do is we compare our insides with people's outsides. And when people's outsides are sunset drinks <coughs> and double rainbows, and then when we look inwards, and we're filled with these massive doubts and fears and insecurities and often complete confusion, it makes you feel weird at best awful at worst. And so this whole idea that um, uh, there's this dissonance and friction that's getting perpetuated in our <coughs> daily lives. And the thing is, is that it's not just this one epic photo that reminds us of this, it's dozens and dozens <coughs> of photos every single day kind of pointing to this um, separation. Um, and this, this notion of identity and authenticity is something I've been thinking about for uh, years and years and years now. And it's, it's fascinating, and, and actually I hope that we can propel ourselves forward beyond this kind of social age. Uh, there's some interesting people doing stuff on this at the moment, a guy called Scott Rosenberg, who's exploring the idea of being ourselves in a post-social age, uh, which is fascinating. Um, uh, the last couple of years I've been working on, a, on a, a project which is about how people can represent their personal, honest, authentic moments of their work lives, uh, so I'd encourage you to check out uh, somewhere.com. Uh, but it's a very, very messy and complicated sort of idea. Identity, authenticity, online, is it fragmented, is it anonymous, is there one identity to rule them all? I, I, I don't know, but when I think about where we're up to, this kind of like really, really rings true and kind of makes me feel maybe a, a fraction sad occasionally. Of course, it's really, really easy to point the camera back and sort of, you know, see the warts and blemishes and all these terrible things, but we actually have achieved a bunch of our stated aims on the internet, and it actually is important to celebrate them. And 
this is a guy called Michael Marin, and he's a young Peruvian guy who lives in the outskirts of Lima. Uh, he drives a motorcycle taxi and supports his parents there. He really, really, really wants to get an education. And he can't afford to study and he can't afford to not work to support his parents, so he's kind of stuck, right? But then there's a platform like Kiva, which allows people like us and people like me to find Michael in Peru and chip in a few bucks so that he can spend and uh, get a few thousand dollars together so that he can go and study motorcycle maintenance in a technical college there, right? And this, this idea that this person that I've never met in a place that I've never been, studying and doing something that I'll never understand, and I can have some type of connection to that, is amazing. Like, that's the internet, right? Because that's a person. And there are so many examples of this. Uh, this is a guy called uh, Justin Hall, who's based in San Francisco. For the last 20 years, he's been sharing crazy amounts about his life online and being very, very confessional. And he's recently talked about his divorce and what's happened to that. And now he's basically sort of making videos in his basement, you know, with kind of a crappy green screen and like sort of doing this enormous experiment in self-expression uh, and transparency. And, and people like these should be supported to, to do stuff, to these these sorts of projects, um, and you know, not have to rely on YouTube ads or you know, Google ads or stuff like that. And, and there's an emerging platform called Patreon.com, which is kind of taking arts patronage into the 21st century. And this is an amazing idea. It's these people making and creating stuff that they're going to share and publish online for free, but they're saying to people, if you'd like to support me, if you'd like to kick in a couple of <coughs> bucks for a video, and we get a whole crew together, then actually those lives and those creative lives can, can become sustainable, which is an amazing idea, and that's the internet, you know? I think my, my, my favourite example has to be this guy, right? This, uh, this guy up at the top is called Pezzi, right? I came across him, and he had this crazy idea to do this project, which is called 1024 Bits and Me, right? And the idea was that he was going to create... 10, 24 pieces of art, these like sort of small uh, little uh, illustrations. People could send in some words or phrases, and he was going to create, come up with, sketch, illustrate, finish, and ship out these custom individual artworks to all the people who'd um, sent stuff to him. So I saw this and I was like, oh, wow, you know, this is fantastic. And, you know, this was the, my first experience with Kickstarter and I thought it was extraordinary. And, you know, I sent him 40 bucks to get four of them. And, and uh, uh, Pezzi probably didn't think about how much work it was to create over a thousand handcrafted, personalised illustrations, right? I backed this project four years ago. He's just wrapping it up now. The, book, the final books are coming out. I was lucky enough to be run over the early ones, and so I got these things early. But here's Pezzi, right? He collected $11,000 four years ago, and he's been belting out these illustrations one by one by one for four years. And I'm like, God, I love this guy. Like, Pezzi is the internet, right? And that's the internet that I love. And um, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm still sort of so optimistic about this and you know these sort of these stated and defined goals of the internet are ones that we're, we're starting to meet and we're starting to confront but when I, I think about all the stuff that we're doing and uh, when I think about uh, this, this, this do, 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 make, 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 you know design, 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 event, event, invent, like there's kind of this extraordinary culture that's cropped up around this. But I know for Kickstarter and Patreon and Kiva, those sorts of things took some really, really deep reflection, right? I love the, the do culture and uh, this idea that you can just create and do loads and loads and loads of things. But I, I found in my own experience that if I don't carve out some space for reflection, then I get into this super intense focus, which is right in front of me, and I do lots of stuff, and I make lots of stuff, and you know, all the people in this room know what that feeling is like, and it's a joy, but it's also occasionally a curse, right? And so what I 
was kind of gifted with this comment by my friend. You know, he said the pale blue dot. I'm like, ah, right, you know, that's kind of what, what, what I need. And, and whenever I think about that now, I think about Sagan, you know, in, in 81 saying, hey, you know, we should turn the camera back. And people are like, well, why? You know, there's no scientific benefit to that. It's not in the plan. It's not why we're doing this. But he insisted. And imagine if we didn't. You know, imagine if we didn't have that little unintended, inadvertent consequence of someone's kind of reflection. Um, and so, you know, I feel like I can now hang on to this idea of not just doing, but doing and reflecting, and doing and reflecting. And hopefully it'll help you guys to think about the pale blue dot so you can point the camera back, reflect on what you see, and make things that are even better. Thank you.